from Hollywood, I'm Martin Grove, welcoming you to our Screen Dollars podcast, Box Office Autopsy. Right now, we'll look at the movie marketplace and analyze how things are going and where they're going sharing some opinions from my perspective after decades of talking about Hollywood on CNN Entertainment Tonight and as a Hollywood Reporter columnist. Horror films have saved the day for exhibitors for months, and this weekend happily brought another one in Paramount's R-rated chiller smile. It was, in fact, a bigger smile than exhibitors expected. On today's box office autopsy, we'll look at the smile numbers, and we'll also check out the opening of Universal's R-rated male romantic comedy Bros., Later, in our Oscar Outlook Spotlight, we'll focus on the strongest Best Picture front runners and see who's also likely to be running in other key races. But we start today with Smile, which topped the box office chart. Here's an inside look at filming Smile that may or may not put one on your face. Smile's a story that's intensely psychological. Action. But it's also instilled with this creeping sense of unease. I'm seeing something no one else can see. What happens when you do see it? It's smiling at me, but not a friendly smile. It's the worst smile I've ever seen. I wanted to create a film that feels like an escalating nightmare. No! No, it's just, no! Before she died, she was smiling. She's faced with witnessing something that is horrific. The evil in the film uses a smile as a mask to hide its true intentions. <laughs> she starts to believe that something evil may have come into her life. Something is threatening me. She's losing touch. Gross. Do you hear yourself? In a very real way. This story is just the kind of thing where you question whether this could happen in real life. And that's why it sucks you in. I really think you should speak to someone. I'm not crazy. Dealing with something you can't escape and not knowing where it's coming from, that's scary. I don't know what it is, but I'm seeing it everywhere. How does it make you feel? What are you? Nothing can prepare you for what's going to happen. The scares. In the way the camera told the story, this is something that we really haven't seen before. And it's so scary. This is not real. It's real. Smile arrived to an overperforming $22 million at 3,645 theaters. Hollywood handicappers were projecting 18 to 20 million, while exhibitors early this week were thinking 14 to 17. What really helps is that it reportedly cost just 17 million to produce. The first choice tracking shows men and women under 25 were Smile's top demos, both in double digits and each four points over norm. Men over 25 aren't excited and are just equal to norm. Women over 25 don't care at all and are one point below norm. Critics on Rotten Tomatoes are 75%. But reviews don't usually matter for horror films. Smile's audience on RT is 80%, which suggests word of mouth could help keep it going. Smile, by the way, is the first opening over $20 million since Bullet Train, starring Brad Pitt, opened to $30 million August 5th. 
Warner Brothers' New Line's weekend two of its controversial psychological thriller, Don't Worry Darling, finished second with $7.3 million, down a worrisome 62% from its $19.4 million opening weekend. That brings its domestic cum to $32.8 million. A big weekend to stumble was expected given Darling's weak exit polls and its 75% audience score on Rotten Tomatoes. Universal's R-rated male romantic comedy Bros opened fourth to an underperforming 4.8 million at 3,350 theaters. The early media buzz had it doing 7 to 9 million. Exhibitors missed by miles with 10 to 13 million. Bros reportedly cost 22 million to produce. Its first choice tracking scores weren't very encouraging, with the average being three points under norm. The critics are a terrific 91% certified fresh on RT, which could give Bros a boost going forward. Its audience score is 92%, which should translate into very good word of mouth. This look at the making of Bros should help you decide if it goes on your must-see list. I wanted a movie that showed in a very funny but realistic way two adult gay men who both prided themselves on not needing a relationship. What happened to those men when they fell in love for the first time? What are you into? One of these boring, ripped idiots with no opinions? No, I like someone who's physically very frail and won't stop talking. The first decision made about casting was that my love interest would be played by another openly gay actor. Fun day! And then, once we made that decision, I turned to Nick and said, everyone in the cast should be openly LGBTQ. We both wanted the same thing. We wanted to be really funny, but let it be honest. This is a historical film, first of its kind. So many people deserve to be seen who hadn't been seen. There'll be tons of new faces that people fall in love with. Nicholas and Billy have been so genius in crafting such a dynamic cast and a diverse cast. We don't see that often. Everyone's really funny, everyone has a different comedy energy. There are also gay terrorists. And there are bi terrorists. Okay, there are trans terrorists too. Caitlyn Jenner. The sheer amount of talent that has not been utilized is mind blowing. These people are queer and talented. Go figure. Now I have to go to a pride party and you're both too old to be in the pool. Please leave. For all of us to get to meet and celebrate something like this is truly an honor. Studio, Nick, Judd, everyone said from the beginning it has to be authentic. Oh my god, do you guys remember straight people? Yeah, they had a nice run. Looking ahead, there's a family film that's finally opening in theaters. Next weekend, we'll see Sony's PG-rated animated and live-action comedy adventure Lyle Lyle Crocodile arrive at about 3,500 theaters. The early buzz from media pundits is for 15 to $20 million. Lyle's based on the children's book about a very friendly pet crocodile living in a house on New York City's Upper East Side. This preview should tell you everything you need to know about having a crocodile for a neighbor. There's a crocodile in the house! Oh, hello. You must be the new tenants. Like to be Valenti at your service. I see you've met my crocodile. He's an extraordinary talent. His name is Lyle. Ah! Shadow of the city. Mom, I swear to you, he's not dangerous. Crocodile! Okay, yes, crocodiles can bite through bone, and yes, they have a taste for human flesh, but he's not like that. He wears a scarf. And he can sing. Are you sure this is safe? Who wants to be safe? We're here to live, and living is a dangerous business. <laughs> that was awesome! 
first choice tracking scores for Lyle are equal to norm. Its best demos are women under and over 25, with both groups one point over norm. So estimates may escalate by opening day. Also on deck this weekend is Disney 20th Century and New Regency's R-rated historical drama Amsterdam, an Oscar contender from writer-director David O. Russell, whose Silver Linings Playbook had eight Oscar noms in 2013, including Best Picture and Directing, with a lead actress win for Jennifer Lawrence. Hollywood handicappers' early projections are for 15 to $18 million at about 2,500 theaters. The first-choice tracking scores, however, aren't looking all that strong right now, with the average being two points below norm, and the best demo, men over 25, one point below norm. Horror fans won't have anything new to see in theaters October 7th, but if they're Hulu subscribers, they can stream the new Hellraiser reboot. Here's a quick look to help you decide if you want to see it or skip it. Beautiful, isn't it? It's really nice. You can hold it. What is it? It's a puzzle. And it's almost finished. Keep going. So if I solve it, do I get a prize? I do. Six sides, six configurations. It opens up and it cuts you. And then they come to collect. It's time. Greater delights await. We wish to see you proceed. blood, their pain, all for us. What is it you pray for? Box office temperatures should soar the following weekend when Universal Blumhouse and Miramax's R-rated Halloween Ends arrives October 14th. Ends should put an end to our movie drought doldrums. Its first choice tracking scores are in double digits for all demos, and they're all over norm. With four quadrants marketing appeal, ENDS looks like a box office powerhouse. Early pundits projections were for 25 to 30 million at about 3,500 theaters, but they've since been raised to 35 to 40 million dollars, and given its tracking strength, that range could increase again by opening day. Last year's episode, Halloween Kills, killed at the box office, opening October 15th to $49.4 million. It ended up doing $92 million domestic, and nearly $132 million worldwide. And that, of course, was during the darker COVID days of 2021. Looking back to pre-pandemic times in 2018, the new take on Halloween from director David Gordon Green opened October 19th to $76.2 million, showing what the franchise is really capable of doing. The 2018 film, said to be a continuation of the original 1978 story rather than a franchise reboot, did $159.4 million domestic 
domestic and nearly 256 million worldwide. Time now to crank up our Oscar Outlook Spotlight to focus on the strongest Best Picture front runners and see who's likely to also be running in other key races. By having 10 Best Picture slots and only 5 noms in other categories, the Academy creates an imbalance that helps some films and hurts others. All 10 Best Picture Oscar nominees can't also land noms in prime categories like directing, lead acting, and writing, so those that do wind up with the advantage of support from multiple Academy branches, and those votes add up later on when final ballots are cast. With October now underway, Oscar handicappers are naming the names they think most likely, at this early point, to land prime noms. Here's an early alphabetical look at the films, some still unseen, getting the most best picture buzz and some of the other top races they're also likely to get into. Babylon from Paramount. Look for directing and original screenplay noms for Damien Chazelle. It also helps that it's about Hollywood back in the late 1920s when sound was turning the movie business upside down. The Banshees of Inisherin from Searchlight Pictures. Look for directing and original screenplay noms for Martin McDonough and a lead acting nom for Colin Farrell. Empire of Light from Searchlight Pictures. Look for a directing nom for Sam Mendes and a lead acting nom for Olivia Colman. It also helps that it's about the magic of cinema. Everything, everywhere, all at once from A24. Look for directing and original screenplay noms for Daniel Scheinert and Daniel Kwan and a lead acting nom for Michelle Yeoh. The Fablemans from Universal and Amblin Entertainment look for a directing nom for Steven Spielberg, an original screenplay nom for Tony Kushner and Spielberg, and a lead actress nom for Michelle Williams. It also helps that this semi-autobiographical film is about Spielberg's own childhood. She said, from Universal Annapurna Pictures and Plan B Entertainment, look for a directing nom for Maria Schrader, an adapted screenplay nom for Rebecca Lenkowitz, based on the book by Jody Cantor and Megan Tui, and lead acting noms for Carrie Mulligan and Zoe Kazan. It also helps it's about a disgraced movie mogul. Tar from Focus Features. Look for directing and original screenplay noms for Todd Field and a lead acting nom for Kate Blanchett. Top Gun Maverick from Paramount and Skydance Media. Look for an adapted screenplay nom for Aaron Kruger, Eric Warren Singer, and Christopher McQuarrie and a lead acting nom for Tom Cruise. The Woman King from Sony and TriStar. Look for a directing nom for Gina Prince Bythewood, an original screenplay nom for Dana Stevens, and a lead acting nom for Viola Davis. Women Talking from United Artists Releasing, Orion Pictures, and Plan B Entertainment. Look for directing and adapted screenplay noms for Sarah Polly based on the book by Miriam Toes. Of these ten Best Picture front runners, nine are also generating a directing buzz. Maverick's the exception here, but as a global blockbuster, it's at a disadvantage to the small specialty dramas Academy members clearly prefer today. Nine of the ten seem likely to get screenplay noms, Empire being the exception. Six of the ten appear to be on track for directing screenplay and lead acting noms. Banshees, Everything, Fablemans, She Said, Tar, and Woman King. They're in the best position right now, but things typically change as the awards season drags on, so it's not over till it's over. 
Meanwhile, over at the HFPA, buried in the group's announcement this week of new supporting acting TV categories for the 80th Golden Globes, there was news that all films and TV shows released during 2022 will be eligible for Globes consideration. That's a good move by the HFPA's smarter new management team because it eliminates the question of whether studios and publicity firms will submit their content to compete for Globes. When the HFPA announced September 20th that it had a new one-year deal with NBC to telecast the Globes Tuesday, January 10th, it noted that Monday, November 7th, would be the, quote, deadline for motion picture and television submissions, unquote. The new decision to grant overall eligibility means HFPA members don't have to worry about whether some major contenders wouldn't be submitted for consideration and would, therefore, be very conspicuous by their absence. Now they're free to nominate whomever they like in all categories, with an eye on filling the red carpet and the Beverly Hilton Ballroom January 10th with A-list nominees. The HFPA still faces potential problems from issues like Tom Cruise having returned his three globes from past years. Top Gun Maverick is now a film to consider for Best Picture Drama. But if they think Cruz wouldn't show up, just imagine the media coverage that would prompt, would they still want to nominate him? And on that happy note, it's a wrap for today's box office autopsy. We'll return next week to see how Lao Lao Crocodile and Amsterdam open, and as usual, we'll turn our Oscar Outlook Spotlight on the latest award season action. So please join us again then, and thanks very much for listening. Time now for our film flashback look at what was happening in Hollywood right around now, way back then. Let's set today's time travel dial for October 6th, 1961. Audrey Hepburn sipping coffee and nibbling on a Danish pastry while gazing into Tiffany's front window in the early sunlight of a New York morning quickly became an iconic movie moment when Breakfast at Tiffany's opened October 6, 1961. Had things gone as first planned, Marilyn Monroe would have been standing there with John Frankenheimer directing instead of Blake Edwards. Truman Capote, who wrote the 1958 novella the Paramount film was based on, had envisioned Marilyn as his elegant lady of the evening, Holly Golightly. But after she was cast, Marilyn's drama coach, Lee Strasberg, warned that playing that sort of part would hurt her image. So the search was on for a new Holly. Shirley MacLaine and Kim Novak were among those who passed. When it finally went to Hepburn, Capote made no secret of being very unhappy. That made Hepburn highly self-conscious whenever the best-selling author turned up on set. In fact, Hepburn thought she had been miscast as Holly and felt that way even after receiving a Best Actress Oscar nomination. Hepburn did, however, insist on having a new director, saying she'd never heard of Frankenheimer. And she wasn't wrong, as he'd only made one small film prior to 1960. After Frankenheimer was paid off, he was suddenly available to direct what became the classic thriller The Manchurian Candidate, starring Frank Sinatra and Lawrence Harvey. 
George Axelrod, its screenwriter and producer with Frankenheimer, also happened to be the screenwriter for Breakfast. Hepburn definitely knew of Edwards, who'd already directed the 1959 comedy Operation Petticoat with Cary Grant and Tony Curtis. Edwards went on to direct a long list of movie hits, including the Days of Wine and Roses, 1962, the Pink Panther in 1963, plus many of its sequels, and 10 in 1979. Edwards had his hands full from the start. The first scene they shot was Holly eating her Danish at Tiffany's. Hepburn, however, hated pastries. That was bad enough, but the scene was complicated, although it doesn't look it, and many takes were necessary, meaning many bites of unwanted Danish. The role was particularly difficult for Hepburn, who in real life was quite introverted, while Holly was an extreme extrovert. To score the film and create a key song for Hepburn, Edwards hired composer Henry Mancini, who'd done the theme for the Peter Gunn series that Edwards directed from 1958 through 61. Mancini brought in lyricist Johnny Mercer, and together they created Moon River, which almost was titled I'm Holly or Blue River. At a studio meeting after an early breakfast screening, an executive said of Moon River, I think the first thing we can do is get rid of that stupid song. Whereupon Hepburn stood up and replied, Over my dead body. And that's it for today's podcast. Thanks for listening. We'll be back with another box office autopsy next week. In Hollywood for Screen Dollars, I'm Martin Grove.